So good evening and uh, thank you for joining us tonight here on our YouTube channel as we're going to be reviewing 2020 um, we're from within the club. Uh, we're joined tonight by uh, Chairman Nigel Travis, the Chief Executive Danny Macklin and Director of Football Martin Lee. So good evening and uh, thank you for joining us tonight mm -hmm. here on our YouTube Thanks channel. As we're um, we have had your questions in by email, um, so thank you for them. But you can also get involved using the um, comments box on the right hand side of the YouTube channel or you can tweet us. Um, anytime you like to get those questions in. Um, but without further ado, we'll hand over to Nigel to kick us all off. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Or if you look behind me, you can see it's still daylight here. So good afternoon from America. Uh, and I'd like to wish everyone a very happy new year. Uh, I'm sure everyone, and certainly we are, is very happy that 2020 is behind us. I hope your families are safe, healthy, if it's anything like some of the families I know in the UK that they've missed their relatives, they've lost relatives. So our condolences to those who've gone through that very difficult experience. Um, we're all trying to stick together as one family. That's certainly the approach we've taken at Leighton Orient. And I want to really start by thanking all of you for your unwavering support of Leighton Orient through what has been an incredibly difficult year. It's been a difficult year to play, a difficult year to operate. And we're gonna try and give you some examples of that as we go through uh, this uh, session. Uh, obviously the year has been totally dominated by COVID-19, totally unprecedented in my 71 years. But it was interesting, I was watching CNN the other day and they had a program on about 1918 it was very similar. Some people didn't think the virus existed. Uh, they had people refusing to wear masks, all kinds of stuff. It was incredibly similar. But I want to take us back first to a year. And who would have predicted what has happened in the past 12 months? And I think for everyone to think, I think it's a tendency for everyone to think that the challenge is localized. But living here in Boston, I can assure you the challenge is are no different from what we've encountered in Waltham Forest and indeed in E10. So going right back to January, the year actually started in disappointing fashion. Uh, we had a, and I remember it was a pretty poor game, a 1-0 defeat at Walsall on January the 1st. Things did improve and later that month we confirmed Ross Sembleton as our full-time head coach and our results improved steadily through February and early March, before we were shut down after our victory at home to Cambridge United on March the 7th. Um, early in, I think it was January, it may have been February, but I think it was January, we held a session with the fans explaining football finances. Uh, if you remember, we had some questions that we asked you all, and little did we know how vital that subject to football finances would be in 2020. Um, we talked at the time about what people thought of how many clubs were losing money. The answer was 75%. We talked about what we could do to boost our revenue. We talked about non-match day. We talked about streaming, which was going to become a very important factor of our fight against COVID from a commercial point of view. Once we got shut down, obviously, we all realized that we were in for a long haul. And I think to be fair, most of us didn't realize just how long the fight against the virus would be. But I think there were some people who predicted that we would not play again until 2021. Well, of course, we started again in September. And hindsight's always great, but many people felt a better result from last summer would have been if we just wrote the season off and had nothing happening for a year. I think my view on that is that was certainly an option, but clearly the government, by its latest action, views football as a very important entertainment and keeping people at home, keeping them engaged. And I know myself, being a sports fanatic, the few months without sports in March, April, May over here, I got very frustrated with nothing to watch. So the government clearly believes we're important. We're an essential business. And given what the Prime Minister said yesterday, 
I think we remain a very essential business to the UK economy. So going back to the first lockdown, we decided we had to be proactive. We had to keep our fans engaged and the team worked phenomenally hard to set up the FIFA competition, which raised 80,000 for charity. It actually went to the EFL for distribution. We got somehow, and credit to Luke, who's chairing this call, and his team, 128 clubs from around the world. If you remember, we lost uh, in that FIFA game in front of 13,000 fans to Moscow Dynamo. Sam Sargent did a good job against a professional game player. We then had the stupendous deal, which was set up by Josh Stevens. He, he put this deal together with Harry Kane and the sponsoring of three major organizations representing key frontline troops. So I think we did a pretty good job keeping people engaged. And then obviously it came to the time when we were gonna come back to playing football and we came back one week early. But I want to say also one thing, I, and I've criticised the government a lot during the last few months, but I think the one thing that's really worked very well, certainly worked better than it has here in the States, has, has been the fact that um, we can actually put people on layoff and pay them, and, and that the whole programme that the government have put in place, uh, and I've forgotten the word right now, Danny? Furlough. Furlough, that's it, that's it, which actually is an American word. The yeah, furlough I had to program. It the first time you said about it. <laughs> Say, say that again. I had to Google it the first time you said the word. The back of it. Yeah. Here we go. It's amazing. I should forget it. Anyway, so it actually has helped us, and I'm sure Danny's going to cover this later. But we've put on put people on furlough several times during the year as the circumstances have continually changed. I think one thing we want to say to you today is what is clear is that running a football club is much more complicated than many people think. It isn't just a case of Martin uh, getting the team out, turning up, making sure 11 players are fit, and we have a few substitutes on the bench. The football club is actually a multifaceted business that includes uh, running restaurants in normal times, hospitality, streaming, running and maintaining a stadium and a training ground, and many commercial activities involving sponsors and obviously the selling of merchandise programs and so on. At the heart of this are many individuals who may be unseen to you, but have done a great job. And I think one of the things that I want to say is I think we as a club are very fortunate to have a lot of creative people in the club and they've worked incredibly hard to try and keep everyone engaged to overcome the difficulties we've had on a daily and weekly basis. And I want to commend the team under da Danny Macklin for the way they've tackled the shutdown. So we came into the season with some goals. I'm not going to go through them all, but basically we said we wanted to try and improve on last year's performance where we actually ended up at the end of the year in 16th spot, um, actually 17th. Uh, we also say the stretch target was the playoffs. We also said we'd like a cup run. Well, I think in terms of the playoffs, we're in a good situation now. More on that later. Uh, the cup run, we kind of had, but didn't have, because we should have played Spurs, if you recall. And that didn't take place because of the COVID issues. We said we also wanted to beat our budget. Uh, our, our budgeted loss, including COVID, was $2.5 million. We'll talk about that later. We wanted to show that streaming could be a way of engaging our fans and helping us recover some of the losses. Uh, we wanted to have the academy having greater visibility. I think, sadly, that hasn't happened because they keep getting shut down and have been shut down again today as a result of the Prime Minister's statement last night. We wanted to think about how we tackled the pitch, and we'll talk about that in this call. But most of all, we needed to manage the health and safety needs of the season, including the capacity limitations prescribed. Well, as you know, we've only actually had two games with fans, so we never had any capacity limitations. Uh, well, we never have really tested the capacity limitations. We did have those two games. And I think as I sit here, I think my prediction is it's going to be a struggle to get fans back in the stadium 
based on what I heard last night, but Danny may have a different view later. I think as I stand back and forget COVID, which is difficult, I think we've seen a much more consistent set of performances throughout calendar 2020 on the field. I think we had a spectacular transfer window last winter when we brought in Lawrence, who I think is the best goalkeeper by far in, in uh, our division. We brought in Us Cisse, uh, who I think has been a wonderfully steadying influence in midfield. And we brought in one of our most famous goal scorers in Danny Johnson, the DJ, as they say on the stream. So I think we've improved. I think Ross has settled into the role of head coach very well. I know people have got views about what he does, but whoever we had as head coach, quite rightly, fans would voice uh, views that are positive and negative. That's your right. And I, just for the record again, I do read most of them. So let's now talk about financials. Basically, the COVID has cost us an extra two million. Uh, we have received some help recently from the league, but it only reduces that deficit by about 25%. But I think we're in good shape. We're in better shape than most clubs. Um, the board has been very supportive. Uh, we see this year as an opportunity. We're not going to be stupid and throw money at everything. We've got to be very frugal. But you need to know that a trip like Carlisle this week is probably going to cost us £7,000 because we have to take two coaches instead of players sharing one bedroom between two it's going to be single rooms uh, and that virtually doubles the cost um, I think one of the really good things that's happened in the last few months has been the salary cap and we'll come back to this later but I just want to remind you that the salary cap in league one is 2.5 million for this year and in league two 1.5 million there are some exceptions for players who have been signed previously they're kind of red circled or as they say over here grandfathered in that means that the salary cap next year is effectively tougher than it is this year martin will cover that later um but football still needs a revolution in the way that it's managed um, and some of the things i think need to be that need to be covered are as follows firstly the efl has a very attractive product it's a very attractive live product. And I know the EFL feel that it can be commercially uh, commercialized around the world in better form. So I know they're working on that. I'll give you one example. Over, the, over in the UK, you see the highlight show on a channel called Quest, which I've never seen. You can't see it over here. And I talked to the EFL as recently as yesterday about that. I think another major opportunity is greater share of the Premier League media revenue. Um, that was essentially what Project Big Picture was about. Each year, the EFL gets from the Premier League 10.5% of their commercial revenue, which is about 350 million. But it's worth noting that about half of that goes in parachute payments from the Premier League to the Championship. And as Rick Parry, the chairman of the EFL, said many times, that's something that needs tackling. And if you don't know, there's a consulting group called Boston Consulting Group, which, before anyone says it, aren't friends of mine who live down the road. They're one of the major consulting companies in the whole world looking at the structure of football. So that's a quick overview. My message to you is I think we've made great progress this year. Thank you to Martin and Danny and teams for, for what they've done. Thank you to my colleagues on the board, but mostly thank you to you, our fans, for your undying commitment. Uh, I'm sure you're going to have some difficult questions and Kent and Matt hopefully are going to join us later in the call. But in the meantime, I'm going to pass back to Luke uh, to take us forward with the agenda. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I believe next we are on to Danny and Danny, I think I've got your um, slides to share as well. Yeah, sound like Chris Whitty here. Well, I'm going to say next slide, please. <laughs> um, Get to head. You got it? This, this won't, yeah, this won't be death by PowerPoint, but yeah, next slide, please. 
Okay, so I won't read everything that's on there. You can obviously those that are watching now or watching on catch up on YouTube later uh, can read it for them for themselves. Uh, but I think it's worthy of just bringing out some of the points that Nigel's just made. There is during COVID, I, I want to applaud every single member of staff for what their response has been. But the response has only been as good because we've been doing it for, to make sure that the club has a longevity of. A sustainable future and that's been by huge phenomenal phenomenal support that we've got from Nigel and the rest of the board uh, that's coupled with the support that we've got from you our fans our loyal season card holders our sponsors and partners literally every single part of the Orient family has played a huge huge part in making sure that when we come out of this Covid crisis that we go out of it stronger than what we went in so I want to uh, repeat what Nigel's just said. I know Martin will, will echo that as well. Uh, that support from the board and all stakeholders has been absolutely phenomenal. Phenomenal. So just in terms of some stats. So Luke uh, and the team, uh, so Jake, Luke and Dan and those that uh, work with the streaming were greatly assisted by David Travis, obviously a board member and obviously Nigel's son. Uh, so some of the figures that you'll see there, we've got an average home audience of 489 plus the season card holders uh, that, that watch, and then an average away crowd of quite a staggering 1,136, which is the average for that is 703 across the league. So our streaming uh, will remain a fundamental part of our business. I think moving forward into future seasons, it may even still be more important than it was in the past, but certainly for this season, it's absolutely vital. Um, we're, we're reaching out to, to, to the fans, I can't believe there are any, that haven't yet watched the stream in the next week or so, really encouraging them to, to tune into the product. The product that Luke and the team have worked on, if those haven't seen it, is absolute first class. We're further improving at every game, but we've got a pre-game, a half-time show, post-game show. So if you've not tuned in, Saturday will be your uh, ideal opportunity whilst we're all in lockdown and not a lot else to do. So as Nigel alluded to, the salary cap, we as a club played a leading role in getting that cap through. We sat on a working party uh, and we're delighted to be able to move that forward, which creates uh, the ability to be a key string in the bow to allowing football league clubs, certainly at League One and League Two level, to start to be on the important road to sustainability that we've yeah, we constantly get uh, blasted for using that word, but it's absolutely pivotal. Uh, then on to our retail sales. I'll get to why, obviously, they were so high, or part of the reason they were so high. Our sales this year are 430,000 in 2020 for the calendar year, which is an increase of 50% from the previous year. And our shirt sales, if you can just move down a slide, Jake, if that's okay. Our shirt sales uh, ended up already selling over to 80 different countries. Uh, we've sold 225% above the average for what normal shirts that we sell. Obviously, a large part of our retail sales are on the back of the award-winning crazy idea that uh, I had and that the team uh, led by Josh were able to deliver thanks to the exceptional support from Harry Kane. That sponsorship alone uh, allowed us to generate huge retail revenue. Uh, as well as create some phenomenal media coverage that uh, any club in any of the world would be delighted to receive. And some of the news channels there that we've done, you have a 15-minute section twice on Good Morning Britain, ESPN over in the States, we have, you name it, we we were on it. Uh, that helped, along with, again, uh, blowing smoke to, to Luke, the, the, the tournament of the FIFA thing that Jake uh, and Luke and Dan played massive roles in and the birth child of it, as well as the creation and execution of it, led to those growths that you can see there across our social media platforms. Uh, that was aided by, you know, we obviously had the Celebrity MasterChef that was filmed just prior to the original lockdown and uh, filmed over, and was broadcast over the summer. Uh, and our commercial income this year is 15% up on what we uh, had last year. So bearing in mind the, the, the trauma that COVID's caused, that's testament to Josh, Parr and Lucy and the, and the supporting team on delivering that and, and the kind support that we've got from our supporters, uh, partners and sponsors. Uh, so there's been a lot of change that we've had behind the scenes over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, on to the next slide please, Luke. So in terms of our focus, you know, we could list a million things that we want to try and achieve and that we need to achieve within the year 2021. But we've highlighted there what we believe to be the absolute core focus. Now, above all else, the well-being of everyone within the Orient family 
clearly comes absolutely first uh, and therefore the compliance of all of the COVID-19 guidelines, which uh, if I showed you the printout of it, it's about 27 trees that we've probably had to print for all of the ever-changing guidelines that we get from the EFL, let alone from the government, that uh, Martin's team and my team have to make sure that we understand every single syllable uh, in there. So that creates some challenges. Uh, but away from that, you'll see that they're, they're the objectives that we're setting ourselves on and off the pitch over the next uh, 12 months, basically an expansion of our of, of our operations from a streaming point of view, growing our fan base, getting new fans in when remember those days when fans were in the stadium. But that yeah, that will happen hopefully in the in the spring, but certainly in time for next summer. And we'll be doing everything we can to generate new fans to come in in addition to the phenomenal loyal support we've got from our season card holders. And that is my snapshot of it. Uh, thank you very much, Danny. And I think finally, in terms of our agenda, is hand over to uh, Martin Ling, Director of Football. Thanks, Luke. And uh, just like to add, uh, Happy New Year to all our supporters. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a testing a testing year, a, te a testing season because of the COVID. Uh, you know the rules and regs and, and what we have to do on a daily basis. Is quite amazing, really, and I'd like to uh, a special shout out for for Keaton Patel, the club uh, physiotherapist, and and also Lewis Spencer, that's both helped with the COVID rules and regs and 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 how we have to do it. But you know, I look at it. Uh, we need to improve year on year. That that's that's the that's the way I look at things. And we talked about uh, finishing seventeenth last year, and we want an improvement this year. You know, so I, I just looked at it. just today. I look back on uh, we played 22 games this season. Uh, we're obviously sitting at 33 points, uh, which comes out at 1.5 uh, per game, and we're in eighth position. At the same stage last year, uh, after 22 games, we was at 25 points, and the average was 1.13, uh, which ended up in a position of 17th at the end of the season. So you can see the improvement there. Uh, there's the improvement has been, you know, we, we are now in a position where we wanted a top half finish uh, and, and the playoffs as a, as a stretch target, target, but we're in touching distance of them playoffs. Uh, I feel that if we, if we have a, a productive uh, January window uh, in terms of some people coming in and some people going out uh, and, and getting the right personnel, we, we can give it a right go between now and the end of the season. Uh, I think Ross has grown into the job. You know, he's he, he's he's now for me uh, a lot better delegator of people because Ross always is used to being a number two, so he used to do all the running around and make sure everything was organised. And sometimes to be the head coach or the manager, you have to take a step back. And uh, I think being a, not being big, not blowing my own trumpet, but by any, being a soundboard and saying that you have to empower people to do things. Uh, because I've obviously I, I've done it myself for 10 years and it entrusted on other people to do it and he's done that really really well and, and people like Danny Sender, Dean Brill and, and Matt Harold have stepped up to the plate and, and, and had to really step up to the plate in the last three games where Ross isn't there uh, hasn't been there uh, but he has you know he's grown into it and, and, and he and he and you know he, he now understands the role because he's had to change from being that number two to being that number one uh, he, you know, his coaching ability and his and his football knowledge has never been in doubt uh, because you know he's got that in abundance. It's just that the man management side of it and managing people that's that's new to him. And, and, and as I say, he, he's, he's really really grown into the role. And the, the, the you know he he knows he's going to be judged on what them figures that we just said the success so far. So so far so good. Still a long way to go in the season. Not quite halfway yet. Uh, and we've got a, an interesting January window, as I said, of people coming in and people coming out. And on the backdrop of that, you've got to start to look at the what will be the salary cap next year. People have got to understand that our, our spend this year will be in the region of 2.3 to 2.4 million pound. And next year, that spend is going to be between, between 1.7 and 1.8. So you don't take a rocket scientist to, to work out there's about, you know, an half a million pound to 600,000 pound shortfall. Uh, so the, the wage cap 
it's been needed, but there is a a, a, a real a real situation for the players to realise there's not as much money out there at all clubs. Uh, that's not to say we still would not keep quality players, but we've got to bear that into mind because you cannot go over that salary cap. Uh, within that salary cap, you can have uh, under 21 players that don't count on the salary cap. So you've got the 1.5 million could be spent on 21 senior players, and then you can have as many under 21 players as you like. But for us, that would probably be in this region of five or six. Yeah, so it's a new it's a new juggling tool. It's something that we've not had to work with in before. But it's the same for every club, and I think it's the, it, it's essential for football. Uh, but yeah, I can't wait for the rest of the season. It's been strange. It's been really, really strange watching games without fans there. Uh, it took a lot of getting used to. Uh, the two games when we had fans, you realise how much they impact on players, tempo of the game, and for us as supporters ourselves to watch it uh, with the fans watching it as well. So we have missed it. The game, ain't, the game ain't quite the same without you. There's no doubt about that. It, 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 it's not. It's not got the same. It's saying the same buzz and atmosphere around it, and it has been strange watching it in in, in, in in empty stadiums all over the country. Uh, but I think that's going to be the case uh, probably for the rest of this season. Uh, so we've got to get used to it. And, and the, you know, the players are now used to it. And we're in a good spot. January men have done well and hopefully can finish off with uh, some sort of success at the end of this season. And that's done for me, Luke. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin. Um, next up, we're going to do a Q&A with, with questions going across to Martin, Danny and Nigel with all, to, all sorts of matters on and off the field. Had a good number in via email, um, but if you are watching on YouTube and, and have a question you'd like to throw into the comment box, then, then please do. We'll try and get around to them. Um, and if you don't specifically read yours out, it might be because we've probably answered it in another question. So um, make sure you listen out for, for those. Um, okay, so to kick things off with a question from Stephen. Um, we'll give this one to Nigel. With 2020 being a very difficult year and looking likely that things will not change dramatically until next season, have any of the current major financial investors lost interest or considered moving on? You're on, you're on mute, by the way, Nigel. Sorry. It's the first time I've said that this year. I know. It, it, it's the Zoom thing, isn't it? You're on mute. <laughs> um, so... Just the opposite, actually. Uh, after this meeting, I've got a call with another group. That's seven groups I'm talking to at the moment. And just to be clear, that's not us selling up. That's us adding to the investor base. The difficulty has been predicting what's going to happen. They all realise that football is going to come out in better shape than it went into the coronavirus. Uh, and that is attractive. I mean, I've heard from a lot of people there's never been as much interest in investing in football as, as there is now. And the reason is the salary cap, the fact that the whole structure of the league is being looked at, Project Big Picture, Boston Consulting Group, all that discussion which is going on, um, at, basically at Premier League level, is attractive. Um, the fact that I think football is really finding ways to improve itself is attractive to investors. I think another reason why American investors are interested is in American soccer, as they call it, you don't have promotion relegation. It lacks the excitement. And very shortly, we're going to announce a linkage with two clubs, one in Australia, one in America, We've with the club in America, we've been talking to them actively and we've gone through two deep dives on our financials and looking at theirs. And clearly, English football has this drama you either get promoted or you get relegated. It's a drama that is attractive, is and that's why we think the media rights can be sold far better around the world because there's very little sport anywhere that's as good as what you see in the EFL and the Premier League, particularly when it involves promotion and relegation. So uh, I feel very positive about this. The problem is, when do we go to investors and say, this is it? 
I mean, we've been talking about it for the last two or three months. But every time we think we've got some certainty that fans are coming back into the grounds or they're not, the things change. So I think we've decided that in the next two or three months, we've got to go and say, this is the value of the club. This is what we need you to pay up and get on with it because we've been very transparent and open with all these people. I think that's helped us build relationships. And as a result of that, I'm hoping two or three groups will sign up in the next two or three months. Thank you, Nigel. Um, we're also joined by uh, Matt Porter, who should be joining us now as a panelist. I think if you can unmute yourself, Matt, then we'll be able to, and, and add your video on, and we'll be able to see you. There Hi, guys. How are you doing, Matt? I'm very well, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. Just joining the Q&A, so we've just done one question so far. So um, if any of these are relevant, then, then please do step in and of course, yeah. um, give us an answer. So on to question number two, um, and it's from Anthony. He said, his question concerns two of our young professionals that aren't in the squad or out on loan, namely Jaden Sweeney and Brendan Shabani. Will they be offered new contracts and why aren't they getting men's football somewhere? Uh, Martin. Yeah, the the simple answer is Jaden Sweeney has been out injured for the last probably two months uh, and, and he's not been available to play uh, senior football. Uh, Brendan Shabani went out at, at Conference South level uh, for a month and uh, has come back to us. Uh, if Brendan doesn't get another... Conference South club because he, he, he probably ain't he's not going to get a conference club or National League club should I say National League South? There's nothing below that that's being played at the moment. Uh, so they're both within. There's 20 players that are out of contract uh, at this football club come the summer. <clears throat> uh, Brendan and, and, and Jaden are two of them, so they go into the mix of. Uh, where we end up at the end of the season, so they're the same as everybody else, but. They 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 probably do need to go out and play men's football, uh, but the opportunity to try and get a men's football is very very limited because there's probably only 24 clubs that you're looking at, uh, and as you say Jaden's been injured as well, so they're they're in the mix with everybody else. Uh, so within the next four or five months, it's very it's very important times for the pair of them, uh, the same as it is the other players who are out of contract. Yeah, I'm sure we'll maybe come on to them in a moment. Um, but sticking with the, the themes of contract, Martin, um, John's got in touch and asked, what kind of contract is Ross on? Uh, how and when will his success or failure be judged with the current squad at his hands? Yeah, Ross is on what's called a 12-month rolling contract. Uh, so at any given time, he's got he's got 12 months on a contract. So there's no, you know, there's not a there's not a, an end date to that contract. So it, it doesn't need to be uh, renegotiated in terms of length of time. Uh, there's obviously could be a renegotiation on uh, the amount of finances that he earns within that contract. But the, the be all and end all is that we felt that a 12 month rolling contract is is the is the fairest way to do it. It gives because managers get uh, relieved of their duties uh, more often than than the normal job. It gives you something to to uh, have there. If, if that's the case, but that's, you know, there's certainly not, and not anything we're looking at at Ross at the moment, but it's called a 12 month rolling contract. Uh, if I'm honest here, if you, if I look at my own uh, time as a manager, I think the first three contracts assigned with clubs were, wasn't rolling contracts. And the last two that I signed were, were rolling contracts. It's something that's come in, uh, in the modern world that was brought in by the LMA League Managers Association. And I think it's fair for all parties, to be honest. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. Um, the next question, and um, Danny, we'll go to you with this one. Um, the question's from Dave, and he says, what has been the average numbers of streaming subs for both home and away matches this season? And what proportion of the £10 is actual revenue for the club? Yeah, so I've uh, sort of half answered that on the uh, on the presentation. But yeah, our average for away is 11.36, which is against an average for the league of 703. And our home audience is really difficult to compare to other clubs because we've obviously got a lot more season card holders than... Than, than many clubs, as a lot of uh, clubs didn't go on sale with season cards. But yeah, we're averaging just under 500 plus uh, a good, good, good large chunk of our season card holders that are tuning in game after game. And then in terms of the revenue... Go on, Nigel. 
Sorry, Danny, I was going to say, I think it's worth telling everyone that we lobbied, you and I lobbied hard for all the away games to be free to season card holders. But right. yeah. we, we, we were not uh, winners in that debate because many clubs hadn't t- sold to season ticket. Correct. Holders. So yeah. there's a lot of self-interest there. So I want to remind season card holders, we think you should be watching them, but it's not our decision. 100%. Uh, in terms of the revenue, it, it, is, it is fairly complicated. Uh, but in a nutshell, we get a, a, a much larger chunk than other EFL clubs because we are on our own platform. All I can say is that yeah, a large chunk, once the Batman's had his small percentage, uh, of the, the, virtually every penny of that goes straight into our coffers. So you, you know, you're, not, you're not feeding another club, you're not feeding uh, the EFL. It's, 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 it's very much helping to reduce our, our loss. Yeah. Um... Danny, if we can stick with you on this one. Um, Tim's asked, could you please ask what happened in respect to the ordering of the replica shirts this Christmas and when orders will be distributed? Yeah, good question. Uh, We had uh, four top-up orders that we placed and the last one we placed in around about August should have been with us first week of November. Uh, We had delay after delay after delay caused by COVID issues within uh, the Far East. Then the ship, I thought this was made up, but the ship was literally going to every port in Britain trying to dock along with every other uh, ship just prior to Christmas. Uh, And as a result, that ship didn't dock until Sunday this weekend. I thought it was made up until I Googled it. Uh, New Balance had done everything that they possibly could to try and get that order to us as quickly as we can. And they're helping to make sure that we compensate those fans that uh, were affected. It It wasn't a large number, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there would have been some disappointed faces on Christmas Day morning. So we're, we're hopefully going above and beyond uh, to r- repair any damage that's done there. And we're confident we'll be able to get those orders out in the very near future. And as soon as they're, they're off that container ship, they'll be in our in our store and then on people's doormats. Lovely stuff. Um, Matt, I'll come to you because Nigel wanted uh, especially questions of kind of wider sport um, potentially to go your way. Uh, and we had a question... That said, in the event that we did make the playoff finals, do you envisage that, that uh, they will take place at an empty Wembley Stadium, or do you think fans will be allowed back by then? Uh, I think by the end of May we'll be we'll be all right for crowds again. We, we you know, when I look at this with a matchroom hat on, where my day to day job is, we've heard on the side of optimism and positivity throughout this this whole um, uh, pandemic. So. You know, we, we've not been making long range predictions or taking long range views on things purely because it is such a, a fast moving feast. But I think there's there's clearly a um, determination from the government now to uh, change the, um, the the landscape and uh, make sure that, um, you know, the, the, as I'm joined by my three year old boys just about to go to bed. Sorry, the <laughs> <laughs> um, wonders of technology. Um, the uh, through me completely the um the, the vaccination rollout is obviously gathering pace you know i think there's the best part of a million people that have had their first dose in this country and that's going to be increased by tens of thousands a day if all goes to plan and clearly things haven't gone to plan but hopefully can start doing so in in respect to that um and and our sort of feeling is that sometime around easter will be when um, we will start to see a, a return to normality in, in some respect. I'm sure that will still include social distancing and other sorts of uh, controls. But uh, we do feel that maybe the first three months of this year will be written off, and then beyond that, it'll start to be a little bit more um, a, a little bit more normal. Mm. Let's hope so. Um, a question from Craig, um, and I think this will probably be best for either Nigel or Danny. Craig's asked, uh, there are a few recently completed small to medium uh, new build developments in the immediate vicinity, and there are a few more major developments planned over the next five to 10 years. With the influx of potential new supporters, what is being done currently to target these residents? And are there any specific additional plans to really entice people new to the area in the likes of the school centre or new, new Spitalfields market developments? Yeah, we were just about to go live uh, in end of March last year, uh, obviously when COVID hit, we were going to do a residential targeted uh, door drop, for want of a much better phrase, uh, that effectively introduced people that have moved into to the area maybe recently and you know, invited them to attend the game. We obviously had to pause the, the print on that overnight. 
Uh, but we will, when we're able to welcome paying spectators back, not just our season card holders, we will go gung ho with that and leave no stone unturned. The the population uh, in Leighton is obviously ever changing, ever diverse. And that's something that we've got to see as a massive opportunity. Uh, obviously, we've got the score centre development. We've got the development of Spitalfields. If you look out of the third floor, even better on the top of the roof, on the fifth floor in the in, in the Just Edinburgh stand, it, the, the, the amount of building works that are still going on. We always joke about uh, Kent's comments about the number of cranes between us and the Olympic Stadium, but it's growing even during COVID. The building work is, is extensive and that provides a huge, huge opportunity to get the next breed of fans into uh, Brogrip Stadium and we will be doing everything we can and reaching out. It's something we've discussed with the supporters club, with Loft, as well as the trust on how we can all a, a joint real effort to get people in and not just in once, but in and becoming regular fans and maybe even season card holders. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Um revert back to Martin. Martin, Alfie's asked, what is the latest with contract renewal negotiations as we have quite a number of players out of contract in the summer? Yeah, as, as I said there, there's, uh, there's 20 players out of our 24-man squad that are out of contract. Uh, the negotiations are ongoing. Uh, we are speaking to new, numerous players at this moment in time about staying with us longer. Uh as I explained earlier, there's also the backdrop of the wage capping. So a realisation check from, from each football player uh, around finances. But no, we, we we know the people that are doing well. We know the people that we would like to continue on the journey with us. Uh, the puzzle this year, I'm not going to deny, is a little bit harder than the puzzles I've done previously because of the wage capping. But that's part of getting you getting you the job done right and getting the right players for the value of money that you've got to spend and that's part of the the, the act of, of the of the wage capping it, it makes better I think it makes better uh, business people of you and business sense of, of the people that are doing it but also makes the head, the head coach has got to work with you know if everyone's spending the same type of money it should be the players it, it should, should be your recruitment and your and your and your coaching and your and your and your management that make the difference to whether you're successful or not. But I'm, I'm not stupid enough to know there's players out of contract. Uh, you know, there's. I think that we've been one of the only clubs during the January uh, window that have been more looking to fetch people in than than to to cut our cost. If if I'm totally honest. So I mean, Nigel and Ken and and the board have been massively supportive to us you know even with the fact that people got to realize when we was all furloughed uh Nigel Kent and, and the board paid us all uh the difference and we all would not one of people well, not one person later on went, has suffered in fi- in a financial way which is which is a, quite amazing when you listen to some of the other horror stories that you hear from other clubs so we're in a good position uh we've got a board and a, and a chairman that, that want, want to be successful. Uh, uh, Nigel quoted just now, we won't suck silly money at it. That's, not, that's never been our style. We like to get value for money and we like to spend our money wisely and we continue to do that, whether that's players on new contracts or fetching new people in. I think it's worth adding, Martin, that uh, there's a lot of players out of contract from last summer and the problem of bringing them in is twofold. One is you need to test them to bring them in because of coronavirus. So you can't just bring someone along and say, right, go out in the field, join the players for practice and we'll see what you look like, which you may have done in the past. But also you have to get them up to speed in terms of fitness. Um, And I think you've had two players who've actually gone through the testing and been on trial and they have so far to go that we're just not considering them. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, you know, it's another thing of, of, of the COVID world. You know, you normally could get a phone call from someone saying, will you have a look at a player? And you fetch the player in that day. Uh, you know, it, it, but it's just, it, it, it's, the, it's, it's really, really awkward to fetch someone within the bubble. Uh, and we're finding that people, there's a lot of people who are been out of contract for like two to three months and, and have lot, lost a lot of fitness over that period 
Uh, and when you, by the time you get them up to speed and then have a look at them, you know the the, the, the moments pass. So it, it's another it's another issue with COVID, without a shadow of doubt. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, a question from Julian, who's asked, um, firstly, what's the projected loss for the financial year? And is there any, any news on getting a Deso pitch? Yeah, in terms of the, the, the loss, with uh, we are, obviously, yesterday's news will have a, a knock-on effect, so we'll go through the re, ever-re-forecasting phase uh, in the next week or so. Uh, but we, we, we hope to have this year prior to COVID, uh, afternoon, Kent, uh, good to see you. Uh, we hope to have the loss a uh, million pounds. That would have been challenging, but we, we had plans in place to, to make that hopefully a reality. We're probably now looking at a loss that is more than double that and potentially as high as two and a half million. Uh, and then the second part of that question, uh, in terms of the uh, potential hybrid pitch, I think that was that was I remember that right. That was the question, Luke, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we we're continuing to do our research uh, into that. It may may be that that's something that we do if we are to do it the following summer. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly our long term objective, and the reason we're looking at that, namely, is to create a revenue and a profit source from it, but to also provide a better playing surface uh, that we can all benefit from. I just think, Luke, on, just to add on to the hybrid pitch, I just think that it doesn't matter what we do at our stadium and, and, and whoever you've got working at that stadium, we've still got that problem uh, on the on the west side, from the west side uh, byline, uh, sorry, touch line, to the 18-yard box, which is treated the same as the rest of the pitch, looks after the rest of the pitch, but if you look at it, you, you can just tell a massive difference. And it's, you know, it's weird, isn't it? Because... The people that play at fullback, obviously Sam plays at fullback and they talk about it's like playing on two different pitches. So in the first half, you've got you're on the heavy side and the, in the second half, if, if how it's worked in the last two games, you're on, you're on the better side. And, and I think that the hybrid for me, obviously I'm looking at the revenue streams, but the bigger thing for me is that we've got a football surface that, uh, that we can rely on and how it is at the moment, it's still a decent pitch. But that bit, that part of the pitch is never going to be as good as it should be during the winter months. I think it's worth saying, you, both the two of you went to Tranmere where we played and Rochdale. So yeah. I'll share some of your comments from what you saw there. Do you go first, Martin? No, go no, no, I'll go first. Look, I went, we went to uh, Tranmere and Rochdale and, 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 and talked to the groundsmen. And, and look, it's, it's, it's like a different pitch. You know, you've got... It's, you don't get divots. You, you don't. You, you know the the remedial work is is very minimal on it. You can get a bit better percent, percentage of uh, of games on it, and it's it, it it's a little bit firmer uh, to, to feel when you get a bit big bit bounce and it, make. I, I personally think it makes the game a little bit quicker. It ain't Astro, but it makes it just that little bit quicker. But I think the way we want to play the game in terms of, you know, a, a, a passing a purpose to our play, I think it would help us. But the, both them pitches were, I've never seen, we put it this way, we went to Rochdale, I mean, then in the day out of Rochdale for our sins. And, and I've never, ever seen Rochdale with a pitch like that. And they had it put in late, Dan, didn't they? Yeah, majorly late, and yeah, we uh, learned some lessons on how how to do it, and perhaps how to how they would if they were given a chance to to do it better next time. Uh, Luke, could I suggest uh, as Kent's only got ten minutes because we he had other things to do today. Mm -hmm. um, Kent, uh, perhaps give Kent a few minutes now. Sure. Yeah. Um... <laughs> In terms of questions that have come in, um, I think some of the ones may have been better for Kent, probably have already been answered. But um, in terms of the wage cap, Kent, would that be one you'd be interested in? Sure. We've been asked, how does the salary cap affect the approach of academy players? Um, and what's the balance on giving them pro contracts to avoid losing them cheaply? Um, um, it doesn't affect uh, players that have you know, that are a part of the academy. Um, if I remember correctly, Martin can correct me and Danny can correct me, but anyone who's under 21, uh, they don't count against the salary cap. 
And then the other thing is, is that there is some kind of a special rule uh, in the in MLS. They call it the homegrown rule. Uh, but I think there is a rule that says that when people come up through your academy, um, then there are ways that that the money doesn't count against you necessarily in certain ways, I think. Is that right, Danny? Martin? Yeah, I just think the thing to, to say, you know, it makes the academy more important because if, I'm, if, if we're turning around and saying we want to go off of 21 senior players and the, like the 21 people that are 21 years of age and under, they don't count. If you could develop a group of them to come in and, and rather than going, obviously, you know, you can go and get an under 21 from another club on loan. But if we can de- develop our own ones, more the better. So I think it makes our academy more important because I think that if we're talking about, you know, fine edges to, to, to win points and see, uh, and have a successful season, your under-21 group could well be the difference. So I think it makes it more, more the, the academy becomes more important with the wage capping than it was previously, is, is, is my feel to it anyway. Yeah, and I think another thing that's changed over the last few years uh, for us specifically is, is that the expectation of how, the level that the academy player is going to have to play at Um, went from the National League and now it's League Two and hopefully it'll be League One. And so what happens is is that the academy, you know, as we move up uh, in the table and as we move up in leagues, um, the pressure on the academy uh, goes up to, to develop better players. The sort of flip side of that is, is that as we move up, players who are better, younger, want to come and be a part of our academy because now we're back in the league or we're in league one or something like that. So I think it balances out, but the academy has always been very important from a player development perspective and from a, uh, a costing perspective. So it's an extremely, it's something that's that we pay a lot of attention to. Yeah. I just think you've got to put a caveat on, on, on as well in terms of, uh, when we was in the National League and wasn't sure whether we were going to go up or, or not go up, we was talking about how can we do the academy without being an academy. So what right. what, we, what we started to do was we did sell a lot, of quite a, you know, quite a lot of our, our uh, better players in each age group. Uh, the, the fact that when people come in, because we couldn't guarantee there would be an academy next year, it wouldn't have been fair for us to hold on to them players. So we sold them. Uh, and it takes a little bit of time to go through. Uh, I think next year is the first year uh, that, that, that it's a, a year that's come through uh, without that uh, pre, pre- premise on it. So yeah, it takes, it's been, it's been, it's been, we'll, we'll, you'll always lose, you know, we'll always lose good boys. So there'll always be people that come and buy them off you. Uh, and we have to accept that because that's what sort of club we are. Agreed. Talking about um, financial change, um, there's a question that's probably a bit broader, but someone's asked, um, does leaving the European European Union have any financial rami- uh, ramifications for Leighton Orient? Nigel. <laughs> uh, okay, Nigel. all right. So, as, as I've said many times, going into the EU was one of the greatest things of my lifetime. I, no one is more upset about leaving the EU than me. So, that that's not necessarily related to Leighton Orient. But I think it's actually bad for the UK. But that that ship has sailed, unfortunately. Um, and I think it's going to have some effect on sponsors because sponsors, in my view, are going to struggle economically. But it's it's going to be difficult to predict what it does with football because what it's already done is means that Premier League players, sorry, Premier League clubs can't go out and bring in a lot of young players from the continent. They have to go through the kind of qualifying, even young players, where they take into account if they've appeared for for their country at certain levels. There's then a point system related to where they come from. Um, and I think it's going to mean that there's going to be a bigger focus on younger British players. And by British, it also excludes uh, Republic of Ireland. So it's just... Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England. And that means there's going to be more people looking at uh, young British players. Now, you could argue that's good for the development of British players because more are going to get a chance. 
but it may be it becomes more competitive for the best ones. So that's my view. But Martin has probably thought about this much more deeply than I have. Yeah, uh, it's you know it's, it's a difficult one because it, like people like if you put uh, Ucise for instance, if Ucise was playing over in France at this moment in time, and I wanted to sign him, I wouldn't be able to sign him because he, he before he had a European passport, so I could sign him. Now he's got to have the, got to have the qualifications to be able to come over, which was the rules pre uh, a while back. But it, you know, it, it's very because you obviously the percentage of people that are playing over at the moment. If you go in the Premier League, they're going to be fine because most of the players they sign from abroad will be full internationals. But when you look at it at our level, you're not going to you're not going to have sign many people that meet the criteria uh, in terms of playing for their, their country a, a, a numerous amount of times. And I think Matt will maybe add on this as well in terms of, because you're with the sport with, with Barry. I remember that, 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 that I think it's going to be awkward, in, 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 in certainly in football and, and sport, Matt. Do you, do, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, there hasn't been a, a huge amount of directive or anything like that from DCMS, which is the government department, um, you know, in respect of some of the more immediate matters. But obviously now the... the, the um, criteria to come and, um, and uh, live in the UK has changed. So as you say, with Ucise, you know, with, with, with other sports people, they have to uh, go through the points-based uh, system. They have to prove that they're capable of doing a job that uh, other people in this country aren't capable of doing. So that's been done through various different ways, international caps or, um, you know, references, statistical proof. But I think you're going to see quite a lot of people applying um, being turned down and then going to appeals. So that'll probably only start to really come out over the next six to 12 months um, when it all settles down. But I think it could be quite interesting because obviously appeals are subjective and could go different ways. So if, if it doesn't work exactly um, for somebody on the points-based system, I think you need 15 points or something like that. But, you know, you, you can get around that or, or, or have some flexibility on that by proving that the player is capable in different ways. Yeah, that, is, that is clear as mud then. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's the best I can do. <laughs> no, I don't have any go at you. I'm just saying the rules, aren't they? That's what they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Luke, I think Kent's going to go in a couple of minutes. Kent, do you want to say anything before you depart? Oh, I, I apologise for being late, and I'm sorry I need to go uh, to another call. But um, as always, the, you know, the club is in a good spot. Um, it's getting better even during very trying times. And I know it's hard being a fan. It's hard to, to watch it only on stream. Um, and it's hard not to be around the players and around the coaches, around the staff. So uh, everybody stay safe, uh, be at your best and do your best. And uh, as always, up the O's. We'll see you all soon. Bye, y'all. Cheers, Cheers Ken. Ken. Ken, can I just ask if it's cold on the balcony? <laughs> uh, we're, uh, it's, uh, I've been waiting for you to pay to have those heated seats installed, Matt. Did, so I'm I not sure on that. where that's at. I did comment on that to Danny uh, at the Salford match where a comment. the official attendance was a world record low for Orient of three. <laughs> yeah, it was so cold that even other people who were entitled to go in didn't pay. <laughs> hey, but, but Ken, I've noted that Matt is paying for them, so... Uh, yeah, that's uh, that was my that's my understanding that Matt's going to pay for those heated seats. So yeah, I'm not I quite sure what the delay is. We'll just have to wait and see. I thought we were going to spend the money we were going to get for selling Danny Johnson next week. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, okay. Now I am leaving. I'm joking, now I'm I am to, leaving. I'm checking now people I am still leaving. watching. Y'all can handle that. Oh, yeah. I'll take care of that. Uh, just so y'all know, I'm not in agreement with selling DJ. Just so y'all know, hey, hey, so hey, everybody hey. knows. I'm opposed to selling DJ. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you all. Cheers, Bye. Cheers Bye. Bye. Wow. Bombshell. But uh, we'll, go <laughs> we'll, we'll segue from that because we've not had a question about COVID in about six minutes. So we'll go back to um, COVID. And a question from Dale, um, who's asked, and it's probably one for you, Martin, um, <laughs> the new COVID officer. He says, um, what effect does the rising cases of corona have on player recruitment? Are we wary in case the league is postponed again? I know it's confirmed elite sport could continue, but with the government, this government that guarantees last about three days. 
Does this mean any potential business may be put on ice and as a result, we, we will miss out on targets? And is there a need to offload before we can bring in? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I th- what I explained earlier, I think it makes a difference to have a look at trialists, but that, that's that secondary. We, we run the club uh, as if we're going to finish the season, which we ex- fully expect to. We, we do what we feel is the right thing in and around the squad. So I'm doing nothing different now to what I would do uh, whether COVID was here or not. Uh, there, it's yeah. There's uh, for me. There's, there's going to be at the end of January the thirty first. There will be a change to our squad. Uh, there will be some ins, as I said earlier, and I think there'll be some outs as well. And and, and you know, some of them people, you know, are not playing football for us at the moment. That that it, it, it will suit them to go out. So I, I, I think it's, it's a. I think it's a shuffling of the pack. Uh, I always call it the evolving squad. I think that me and I think it was me and Matt that was talking previously uh, about. There's been a lot. Of, if you look at our squad, there's been a lot of people that have been here from the first day that we walked in. Uh, in terms of being here for the, the three and a half years, four years. So, like in like in any business or in any any football club, I feel there's 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 change that you know I think a little bit of change at this time when we're in such a good spot is is good to freshen things up, to fetch a couple of new ones in. If I could have a window, say I, if we could have a window of uh, last January with Vigoro Johnson and Cisse, <laughs> it'd be it'd be lovely and it'd be an easy job. But no, I think there's there's ins and outs. I don't think we have to we have to we have to work. Uh, as if COVID isn't there, we have to we have to do everything in, 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 that makes the club stronger going forward, and, and and that will be the way that we let players go and, and, and fetch players in. I think what I'd say is I don't think the government wants football to shut down. I think they've made that clear. I don't think the EFL will ask to have it shut down because it has an impact on particularly the Sky contract. Uh, so I think, as Martin said, we have to struggle through. I could argue that for once, having played more games than some other teams, we're in a better position because some teams are going to end up, in my view, playing three games a week at the end of the season. Because even though someone on Talk Sport, which, by the way, I can hear here, even though it's in London, someone said on Talk Sport this morning that the EFL can go on as long as it wants because... They're not involved in the Euros. Some EFL teams are, have got internationals who are involved. So I think that's false. So I think we will see some teams playing with playing with not a full team. I mean, they'll get 11 out, but they won't have the subs. Uh, they'll be struggling because of injuries, suspensions, COVID, uh, and they won't have the resources to bring more people in. So I think that's all to Lake Orient's advantage. Um, looking at the questions, I think we're probably coming to a, a natural conclusion, but um, obviously we touched on a potential partnership with Australian and American clubs earlier. And Ashley's asked, will these strategic links with the Australian and US clubs provide the opportunity for player loans? OK, so that's an interesting one. And Martin and I talked about this as recently as yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, yesterday, yeah. Um, OK, so I'm not going to reveal the club yet because we want to make a big announcement, but... They're really good people. And this particular club has a relationship also with Southampton. And they've had players on loan. The way it works in America is they have seven international visas. Uh, It's a club in the USL, which is the level below the MLS. And they're in the USL Championship. Um, And they have seven international players every year. So Martin and I talked about using that as one of the benefits. Um, And... uh, Apparently, it's worked really well. I mean, they've had players come from Southampton, players go back. It is more difficult, and at the moment, I would say impossible to take players from the US the other way. But, you know, we got a couple of players, maybe the young players that we talked about earlier, like Brendan or Jaden, who could go on loan. That would be a good level for them to play in the summer. We haven't worked it out yet, so we're not going to, so it's going to happen, but certainly there is an opportunity there. But we also see coming out of that relationship, learning from how they do things, uh, also some commercial sponsorship tie-ins, 
And, and something that we're really kind of excited about is we will say that the club in America, which I'll say is in the Northeast, uh, if you go to America, if you're a Leighton Orient fan, you have free access to their games if and when we can all travel and vice versa. So it's a way of uh, broadening our reach and their reach as well. Yeah, and I think it's important. And what Nigel said there is that when when their season runs, because their season's up and running when Anne's closed down. So that's, you know, there's a free month there, either a player coming back from injury that needs to get fit or a player that, you know, that is a younger player that needs to get experience. You could send out there for three to four months. As Nigel said, it's a lot more difficult doing it in reverse because what we talked about before, unless they've got a dual American and British passport, it's almost impossible. But also for us, we've got soccer camps all over, all around the world now. You know what I mean? It's, it was someone had said to that when I first come into this club that we'll have soccer camps over in America, you know, Italy, Denmark. You know, it, it, it's it, it's it's amazing, really, uh, where it's going. Uh, and the more of them we can do, the better. Uh, but uh, the, the tie ups, the tie up to the to these clubs is a uh, a real good thing for the club, I believe. Mm. Um, well, with that, I think that will probably it, be it in terms of um, our questions. I don't know if Nigel, you would have anything you wanted to uh, add towards the end? No, I, I think I'd just say, look, as I said at the start, thank you to everyone. These are the most trying times any of us have seen. I mean, Matt, he and I talk again about all the time about darts and how he's fighting the battles there, it's really difficult. I mean, it's no different over here. I mean, going back to um, bringing free agents in, in the NFL, for a free agent to go to a camp, you need to have six negative tests before you're allowed to try out. I mean, that shows how difficult the world is. So this is all new for us. To be brutally honest, we're, we're doing things that some of us probably aren't qualified to do, but we're asked to continue. Uh, I mean, going to Carlisle this week, if it happens, because the weather looks a bit cold and snowy, but if going to Carlisle this week, it's going to be difficult how the players get their food. I mean, restaurants and hotels are closed. I mean, everything is a struggle, but I, I think the big message from this call is we're trying to do business as usual, best we can, despite everything that's going on. And I think we're in a better position than most other clubs so we feel good and we feel very good about the support we received from all of you our fans so thank you yeah, yeah i think luke if you don't mind me just saying in, in on that because i'm probably of, of the five of us that i'm guessing are on everybody's screen at the moment i'm probably the one who's most outside the club in terms of day-to-day -day communication and work but I, I still speak to to everybody there that you see in front of you on a regular basis and see Danny and Martin and Luke in particular, you know, every game. And I've got to say that the work that these guys have done to keep our football club going over the last nine months has been unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, all the regular things that we would talk about, the regular parts of their jobs that they would have to do, they're having to do that around having a full-time job that is essentially about COVID at the moment. There's that it is taking up so much, if not all, of everybody's time to keep the club on an even keel and keep it progressing and keep it able to field 11 players on a Saturday. And clearly we had that huge interruption in September, which would have sent a lot of clubs completely sideways. And all right, we came back against Cheltenham, didn't play great and lost that one game. But then since then, you know, we've been back as being a regular team. We've won more than we've lost. The team's doing well. The players have been able to focus on football. The extra resources that have been laid out for them in terms of the way we travel away with two coaches, the, the, the single rooms that the players all now have to use, the expense that has been incurred to make sure that the football club has every opportunity of doing well at this time is something that most people won't see. And that's not anybody's fault. It's just the way the world is at the moment. But you, the, 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 you, you have to take it from me that what is being done to keep this football club progressing at the moment is something that I don't think any, I'll say many, but maybe not any others in League Two are, are, are doing at the moment. So I think you should all be, you know, you should all be as grateful as I am as a lifelong Orient fan that, that we've got these people around us to, to keep the club going. We, if we make the playoffs this year, if we make it to League One, it'll be an unbelievable achievement. And, eat, and if we don't, it will still have been 
a good season to have done what we have been able to do so far. And, and you know, that's something that we, we shouldn't lose sight of. It was great to have guys back in, you guys back in for the Newport and Bristol Rovers games. And that's, that, that really lifted everybody just for, just for that week or so to see fans back inside the stadium. It might only be, might be the only time that happens this year. Um, but, you know, your, your support from afar is, is so appreciated. And, and I know that you, that you also appreciate what everyone, you know, who you can see in front of you is doing for the football club. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I think we'll let you off your DJ comments after that. <laughs> well, that was clearly a joke, Luke. I mean, <laughs> Twitter's going to be on fire when we come out of here. You I've know already that. had one tweet from someone who thought it was unreal banter, which is the first time I've ever been described as having that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, um, I think on that then, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll call it a night. Um, a big thank you to everyone that's um, sent in questions for this evening and a big thank you to everyone that's um, joined our call, Danny, Martin, Nigel, Kent and Matt. Um, and we look forward to speaking to you all again soon. So thank you very much and good night.